Number one, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. This is a big moment. We are now only one Patreon supporter away from achieving our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their order to Catoctin Creek Rods. They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, be entered into weekly prize giveaways, members only content, and so much more, including our big get together later in August. For more information on the link in the episode description, we did it guys, we're one away. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we are heading back to, and you guessed it, the tidal Potomac River. And we are gonna be hitting one, like one of the bigger tournaments that actually go on this time of year, the Elite 70s Team Trail. I wanna make sure I preface that because there's also the Alpha or beta, alpha, beta, beta, omega trail, the individuals tournament that has not actually dropped yet on the Potomac. Hopefully I'll get that winner on as well. But we have the two winners this time. We have Blake who's been on last fall and then we have his partner, Cooper. Guys, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I mean, first thing off the bat, how did you two meet? College fishing. Really? Yeah. We, uh, oh, yeah, we cool. started up the club at JMU, two of the OGs. Cooper was the treasurer, hence his job <laughs> as a financial planner. <laughs> and uh, I was the president. So yeah, it was a good time. Okay, yeah, he was the money, you're the visionary. I, okay, this definitely works. This is like- I was like leaving out a little bit of the spender. story there. <laughs> I was yeah. the spender. Absolutely. He, he, he reined me in. Yeah. Still it was does, like, but I'm like- How much beer is in the budget run. on this tournament? And, uh, <laughs> you know. It's hard to it's hard to move the books in that direction, but um, no, I, I actually I won treasure, and then Blake I think was like, who the heck is this Mexican? Like we, I have no idea who this guy is, and um, <laughs> yeah, the rest yeah, of history. Had, but it ended we up ended up having because well. getting people to sign up was like, as you know, we we've kind of talked about it before, and you've talked about other college teams. Like you have a couple guys that you know you'll we'll get together, and then at that point you're just trying to make the school happy and check all the boxes. So we had yeah. to have an election. Um, and so he signed up. We made everybody send in like a bio for what they're, why they should be in the position they're in. And of course, you know, like his passion for not spending money was perfect for treasure. And um, and so it's funny. I, I looked at it and I was like, I have no idea who this Mexican guy is, but <laughs> hey, he won the, he won the uh, treasure and turns out he's not Mexican completely. <laughs> um, and if he was, it'd be really weird because he's definitely a Jew. So <laughs> it just takes a lot of minority boxes that are needed in this day and yeah. age. Yeah, See, I was carrying really well. the club, man. I was carrying the club. Okay, and yeah, you he were definitely car- kept us alive. Oh, well, and it sounds like you kept it alive financially. How did you guys do as a fishing team in college? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> what does Flax say? We did okay. We didn't fish together in college, though. He fished Aww. with another one of the guys we travel with. Um, yeah. So we, I fished with a couple different guys. Um, but yeah, Cooper fished with Daniel in college, who al- also fishes the Elite 70. Yeah, I mean, we did decent. But to be honest, like I didn't do a ton of tournament fishing before college. Daniel didn't really either. He had just bought a boat. And so it was just us trying to figure out you know, how to navigate the tournament world. Blake had been doing it since high school, so he was the most seasoned out of all of us. But you know, the rest of us we were just—if we caught five fish and we had a good time, we were you know, we were happy. Like obviously, we wanted to qualify for nationals and you know do well. But at the end of the day, you know, it was it was college. We were just having fun, and it it wasn't as serious as you know the group that we're in right now takes it. Yeah, what was great. that transition like from college to what you're doing now? Was that rough? I mean, we got our ass beat. Yeah. Like we we did not do well our first year in particular. Um, for me, like coming out of college, I knew 
I either wanted to fish the Elite 70 or the BFLs, and I could only afford one of them. And then, so basically, when I got drawn to join the Elite 70, because they do that random drawing every year, um, I was like, all right, that's what I'm doing. Because it's once you're in, you're you're in until you drop out. So yeah. that's good to just let the audience know that for the Elite Seventies that uh, Mr. Camp runs, I believe for both the Alpha and I want to say Alpha Omega, but the Alpha and the Teams events, it's a what Powerball lottery to then you get the ability to join if you want to. Correct? Yeah, he he'll take a list of names in the fall. So if you're following either of the Facebook groups or friends with him on Facebook, um, you can throw your name in the hat. And so like I threw me. Uh, and his name in the hat and then like when it got drawn basically that was they drew my name out and we said all right let's rip it but so like let's say you and your dad or you and your brother wanted to fish it you can both put your name in the hat give you double the chances if you is it like the elites where if you really suck for a couple of years you get booted because of no, shame there's or of, there's plenty of people who do that <laughs> yeah. um Frankly speak, like it, it's such a good group, like to him and to me, integrity is really important to them. So like competitiveness is, but integrity is too. So he runs a polygraph or two at every tournament, which is super important. He, he makes sure that like when people get in, he talks to them and is like, all right, look, these are the expectations. And, you know, he has a conversation with you and it's, it's run a tight trail. Self police is pretty well. And, I, I genuinely think that, like, if we were comparing the BFLs and the Elite 70 and Cooper, you may see differently, but I'd say that the I uh, like, I would, I've never once been suspicious of cheating in the Elite 70, and there's definitely been some suspicious moments in the BFLs. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's hands down such a better run trail and operation. I mean, Steve just does a great job with it, and the group of guys are just incredible. I mean, and we got some sticks in the group too. It's I mean, so there's multiple hard. guys that have fished classic fishing. Yeah, and that's interesting because it, it's so hard when it comes to the cheating aspect because everyone says that about kayak fishing. It's like, oh, well, it's easier to cheat. It's like, yeah, but, you know, on the flip side, people are stuffing weights into walleye and creating fish <laughs> traps. So if you're going to cheat, you're going to cheat. Like, there's really nothing you can do about that from a except shame the shit out of them when they get caught. Honestly, that's about it you can do. It, it is interesting when you think of organizations making them – a club, a private club, so to speak, where not everyone can get in, which is great because it does thin the herd. And then there is about that rotation of talent. So that way you're not just someone that's stuck in there. Cause that's something I get upset about with the, with the Bassmaster elites, honestly, where you have people that are like, Hey, as long as I just don't suck, I can just stay here indefinitely. And we all know who we're talking about when I say that, and they get by by that, but like, they're just good enough because they've been there long enough. They know the places and they're just good enough. And those are also the people that bitch at McKinney and all these other kids are like good with the forward facing sonar. It's like, how dare these kids come in here? I've been here for 2000 years, blah, blah, blah. With that said, you two were the new kids on the block when you joined the elites and you're dealing with people. I guess this is kind of when scope really started to take off that have fished these Virginia lakes a few times. What was the biggest curveball for you guys to kind of adapt to i don't know cooper what do you think i mean we we grew up fishing you know some of these areas right but i mean i think it was clear in day you know when we first started there were a lot of guys who were just you know running their milk runs on lake anna right they had their good areas and 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 they run those milk runs and it felt like at the first you know it's hard to compete with that i think um and as as you get some experience as you get to know you know the fishery a little bit more i think that helps but also you know i think blake and i have done a really good job of being able to and this goes back to our college experience of just going to a lake right that we've never been before and breaking it down and so even though we have some history that we can definitely utilize i mean i think we every tournament we go into it and we say okay we got to break down the water right now um, and we're not always fishing at the same times and, you know, conditions are always different. So, um, I think that's the biggest thing that one of the biggest things we've adjusted to is like, maybe when we first started, we were just trying to fish history a little bit more and thinking that a lot of guys are just running their milk runs. And, you know, as the last couple of years have, have played out, we've done a much better job of reading conditions, fishing in conditions, listening to our gut, um, and not just, you know, slamming on history because we caught a five pounder here one time, you know? Yeah, I mean, I've fished the James River my whole life, and last year Cooper caught a five pounder off of the 
jetty that I had fished like one time in my life um, because we just were running the pattern, right? So instead of just burning gas and running a milk run, we, we had kind of gotten bit and we were like, all right, let's run with it. And he caught five pounder doing it. So it, it's things like that that definitely help. Um, I think that, yeah, that there's some damn hammers in, in the Elite 70, right? You got the guys like Prosnick, the Waggies, um, uh, Chris and Wu Daves. Like, you've got so many guys in there that are really good. Like, Zach Stupa won the BFL uh, AOI last year, I think it was for Shenandoah. Him and his dad fish at Elite 70 and win and make a lot of money and are always waiting for a check, right? So there's a lot of really good guys that, you know, like he said at first, we thought they're, they're just local sticks at all these lakes. And then you come to realize, no, they're, they're adjusting well. It's, it's interesting, especially when you fish something so much. And I'm, I'm on the fence about if that helps or hurts you, because if you look at people that like run Occoquan Reservoir or places like that, where you know the names that are always in the top, the Potomac River, the James, but does it hurt you having too much knowledge? Like, do you think like some of these people in the elite series, like, or it doesn't even have to be the elite 70, but like the bass master or whatever, can you have so much knowledge that it makes it hard to make the right decision? If that makes sense. For sure. We've started in the, in the same cove in like three elite seventies at Smith mountain and caught like one bass out of it in a tournament. But in practice, we catch all the four or five founders in the world out of it. Yeah. We just go there because it's got a good name. That is one way to do it. I feel like you guys have dice in the back of the boat and you just throw them and then wherever the dice land, that's where you're going <laughs> to Yeah. We just, uh, like, we've definitely gotten burned by history and also not burned. So I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think you always got, you just got to play the conditions and you get, again, it's, it comes down to the gut and making good decisions. And, and that's something that I think we've done a really good job of all year, even though this is, you know, our first big check this year. Uh, we've always put ourselves in the position and made good decisions. And and again, you know, you can get the analysis paralysis if you have a thousand waypoints in, in a place and it's like, all right, where do I run to next versus, you know, you, you're you're settling down. And I think Blake and I have done a really good job of that is finding good areas in practice and then really expanding upon that in the tournament and not just burn gas to burn gas. So, I mean, I think it goes both ways and I think it depends on the fishery too. Like the Potomac, I mean, it takes a long time to fish some of those grass areas, right? And, and flats and you got to be patient. And if I'm just running from place to place, running and gunning, you know, maybe I'll miss some things in some life and some activity that I wouldn't have seen if, if I wasn't patient. That's just something that's helped me out this year that the first two years of the podcast, I guess this we're almost to year three, Never mind. So yeah, so you get so much information that there's overload. And it's just coming to the simplistic, I just need the area that has the most fish and that's it and figure them out. Like, And that's so hard to do because your brain wants to get more granular. It's like, I wanna know which stump they're on, the bait and stuff. And and that's, it blinds you to too much stuff that you're gonna find out on the water. And even this this last Potomac River tournament I, I fished, yeah, it's so easy for me to try to get as much information as possible, but it's almost, I need to tune that shit out and be like, what section has the most smallmouth? That's all I need. Just go out there and let them tell you. That helped a lot, having that maturity finally to do that, where you're trying to push away too much information because it does. It It's so hard to fish other people's fish, and it's so hard to get overload of, of like you said, analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, go, go for it, Blake. Go. No, you got it. Larry, you had something very like poignant to say. No, I mean, I was just thinking of, I was listening to, um, I think it was, yeah, it was Patrick Walters on a, on a podcast and he recently, and he just won another MPFL. It's number four in two years. Um, and he was saying how at Pickwick, like he didn't fish in practice. He doesn't need to dial in the bait. You have your confidence baits. You know what you're going to throw. You know your rotation. He's like, guess what? If you pick up that jig, you're going to throw because you have confidence in it and they don't bite it you're still going to throw that jig in the tournament because it's the confidence jig. He's like, so I don't even worry about dialing in baits. I worry about finding fish. And he idled for eight to 10 hours a day and won another shield. I forget. Crap. I heard something else from a cool angler. Who the hell was it? But it was something like he, he lives close to some big lakes in, um, in the Carolinas. And he all, maybe it was Brian thrift, I think, but he, he fishes these like shitty, like little lakes you never heard of. And those are his home lakes. He beats up. And, 
the question was like, well, do you wish a big tournament? I was like, no, because I fish it too much. And it was such a weird thing. But it, when when the conversation continues, it's like, because I, that's where I go just to practice with baits and just beat fish up, I have too much knowledge there. But be, I go there so I don't go to the other big lakes in the area so I can fish it fresh and open-minded. And I thought that's an interesting mindset of like, yeah, your place that you go every single day the Potomac River I sucked at when I fished it every day. When I moved away from there and I would go there more as an occasion thing, I started to fish better. And I didn't know why until I started the show and talked to people. I was like, I was so in the know and trying to get too granular. First to be like, yeah, Belmont Bay has them. I'm just going to go there and figure them out. And I would do that and boom, I saw things that I completely forgot about. Um, just inter it's, it's so interesting how we make this sometimes overly freaking complicated. We really do. Oh, yeah, we definitely do. With that said, before we get into the big event, how has your year started off with the old Smith Mountain Lake and, and continuing to where we are at the Potomac? Super mediocre. <laughs> like, we finished like a pound out of a check like three times at, or less than a pound. And I mean, we fished clean, made good decisions, just weren't we like a Smith Mountain. I mean, we weren't on good fish. We didn't. We had one spot with good fish, and we roll in there. There's like five boats. They're all pinging the same school. It's like, all right, well, we're gonna go back here, and they wouldn't even react to a bait and turn around and leave. Like there was, we weren't on good fish, and we made, we just survived it. Right, we survived every tournament until this one. Well, we almost failed at the James, but we did okay. Oh yeah, I mean. I'm I think Blake undersells it a little bit. I mean, I think we had a pretty decent year going into this tournament. Obviously, the win catapults us up in the AOI category. But, I mean, I think we finished, you know, maybe top third pretty much every tournament. Um, I was looking at it the other day. I mean, you know, we caught, you know, 12 to 14 pounds pretty much every tournament. It just, you know, we didn't, like Rick Blake said, there's just some tournaments we weren't on, you know, bigger quality fish like we found in the Potomac. Um, but Again, I, I wouldn't look back at any of those tournaments and be like, man, I, I I had a ton of, you know, I wish I would have done this differently. I wish I would have done that differently. Um, yeah. I think we approached it the right way. We did the right things. It just, it didn't happen for us like it did, you know. Well, don't... well just to make sure that people understand this. So Elite 70, I'm assuming there's like, what, 70 to 90 anglers around there? There's 70. Well, it, it ends up being 75 now because of contingencies. So, like, I think Phoenix and some of the boat companies require 75 now, and it used to be 70. Um, actually, the LLC is Elite 60, because it used to be 60. Um, mm. And that, then as the contingencies have rose, in order to keep people able to get their contingency money, we've increased the field size a little bit. But it's so, like 74, 75 now. 74, let's just go 75, fine. 75 anglers. Yeah. Smith Mountain Lake, where did you finish? Uh, I was actually looking at this earlier. I think it was 21st. Um, That's not bad. Okay, 21st. The weights were terrible at that tournament. Terrible. That can't, you can't control that. So yeah, yeah. you got a, a top 20, and then around top 20. What about Kerr? Uh, we didn't fish Kerr. Yeah, Bugs is our two days. So we went, what was it? We went Anna next. And that Anna. was kind of a spawn tournament. We just didn't, you know, we didn't find any big ones. But I think we were we like Chaz, 25. Chaz oh, yeah, I forgot about that. You're, you interviewed him once after he won the Alpha this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was sitting on our big one that we had marked on a bed when we roll in there. He called that's, it. That's about right. He yeah, we were both like a pounder, right? What? It was a six pounder, right? It was big. Yeah. <laughs> Dumb. I think it. Yeah, they got a check. We didn't. But what did we get there? Like 20th? I think it was like 25th, something around there. Um, Chawan was next. And I think we placed like 16th or 17th, you know, just right out of the money. Um, James was, I think, our lowest finish. And I think we caught like 14 pounds or so. But I think that was, you know, everyone just smoked them that day. And we caught a lot of fish. It just, again, they were um, so based on my mathematical skills here on my phone, then you're averaging a in the top 25 to top 30 percent tile, basically, of anglers, which doesn't suck. It's that weird gray area, because I feel like if you're lower than that, where you're like finishing in the top, like what, 50 percent, like, OK, fine. But if you're top 25, top 30 percent, that's not bad necessarily. Where, where does that put you in AOI before the Potomac River? Well, yeah. 
12th, yeah. I mean... 12th without a check. In the check range in AOI without a check, baby. And that's yeah. what's interesting, because if that was the elites, the, the elite elites, or FLW, or BBT, or whatever, that's a hell of a finish. Yeah. With the uh, angler quality that you're facing, like it, a top 12 isn't bad. It, it would get you to the classic easily. Yep. Yeah. But... No, I mean, it. like last year, we avoided the bomb this year, right? So we've always bombed one or two. And we avoided, we, we made it a, a goal, like going into the first tournament of like, we need to make sure we maximize what we found in practice and to, before we go looking for a big one. Where we used to get antsy with four fish or even with five fish and like, ah, oh, we got to get a big one, got to get a big one. And it's like, dude, you might run into a four pounder and the weights might be tough that day and you might get a decent, a little baby check or, you know, like we, we focus more on that less going for the jugular. Um, I, I, I'm glad you brought this up because there are some people that are like, all I do is just swing for the fence. And that's all I do. And then I, I've mentioned on my show before, cause I had two, two terms I bombed this year because I decided to be in the boat with Phil when he threw a 13 inch glide bait and caught 40 effing pounds. I was like, well, fuck, I'm going to do this the rest of the year. Cause that's an intelligent decision. I, I suck at swinging for the fence. And when I switch to like, you're just going to hit singles, just do a high batting average. Everything worked out better mentally for me. I made better decisions because I wasn't thinking about, well, how do I force a big bite? Yeah. It, I don't think that's talked about enough as fishing. It's like, I feel like when you're the guy that just says like, I'm going to swing for the fence, that opens the door for bombs. That will happen 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. But I agree too. And, yeah. and we knew that and, and we've done that in the past. And, you know, there's times where we've caught, you know, the five, six pounder and it's definitely helped and we've cashed a check because of it, but there's a lot of times where we bombed it. And then, you know, this season we, again, made a concerted effort, like one, let's not leave fish to find fish and two, let's get five in the boat, right? Just get mm -hmm. five in the boat early, get that momentum going, feel good about ourselves. Cause you know, it, it's pretty shitty when, you know, strikes 12, one o'clock and you got two or three in the boat and you're like scrambling. So for us, mindset and, and fishing is so much mental, right? Uh, it's, it's easy to spin out, especially in really bad conditions. And so for us this season, we were very adamant. We need to get five in the boat uh, and then make good decisions off that momentum. And, and that's what we did. And again, you know, Put ourselves in positions but you know didn't really materialize this first few tournaments not to say the gay old cliche but it is like when it's your time it's your time like i and i know there are some guys that are just good at catching big fish but i mean even i i keep when people ask me about what happened this past weekend with me like when you catch an almost state record it's like it was just a regular spot that had a bunch of fish i casted it in there and it was the it was the six the five pounder that hit it not the two pounder like it that was I wasn't specifically targeting him and like it is like when it's your time to catch the big one it's your time but you can control the bomb you you really can by catching yeah. that limit uh yeah. I, yeah it's that human element though man you're right like we get so paranoid of not catching the big ones huh yeah we we kind of reversed what we used to do we used to start on our best big fish stuff and then go and lay down the bun at the end of the day we kind of reversed that this year and ended up finishing fifth in the points and um it's worked out for us and it got you this this stellar win. And then before yeah. we really get into this, was this your first win on the elites, uh, the team? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that, yeah. okay, cool. So we'll, I'll set the stage for you here. The James River was beforehand. Title event gets you started. You weren't stellar with that. Going from the James to the Potomac, what were you? What was your game plan practice wise going into it? I mean, we went up, what was it, the two weeks before, the weekend before 4th of July. Um, one reason, nope, or not as many big boats out there as there will be on the 4th. Just tear, you know, those big 60 and 80 foot boats just are not fun to be around. Mm -hmm. um, another reason being, like, the tides are the same because the tides are on a two-week cycle. So we, we had the ability to go up there two weeks beforehand, and we kind of just split up water. Like, he ran a lot of the stuff around Smallwood and, and Leesylvania, you know, that what I would call middle river section. Um, I ran down river and the middle river. I came up and hit some stuff that was kind of unique main river, uh, more main river stuff. I hit a lot of that. And on the middle just, river. 
Oh, middle uh, river. I'm sorry. Middle. Yeah. yeah like, like if you yeah, thirded the I'm river a stroke. Yeah. Yeah. From DC to the bridge, I think you thirded it. Right. So you have, we never really went up river too far. Um, I mean, maybe a little bit. I went to a Creek, like one Creek above Belmont, but that's about as far up as I went in practice, huh. like just kind of trying to identify the areas that we thought the groups of fish were living. And honestly, we freaking smoked them. Like they were biting that weekend. I had like 18 pounds and 18 something one day. He had like 15 both days. A buddy of ours had 19. Like they were biting. But there was also no boats out there. And it was awesome. It's the most fun I've ever had on the Potomac. Like it was unbelievable. Yeah. It's got to be worse though if you catch them everywhere in practice. Because it's like, well, fuck. What do I do? <laughs> what do we do now? Yeah. We, but we were able to identify like a couple, I'd say three or four areas that you know, we wanted to hone in on and because on the day before the tournament because of what you saw condition wise or because of the size of the fish. Both. Yeah. Both, both. like the, the health of the grass, the tide cycles. Um, the, and then of course the quality of the fish, were we catching two pounders or were we catching pounders? Cause there are so many 10 inch and 14 inch fish in that river. Mm. Do you feel like in a one day event you have to, drive as far as you do in a multi-day event if you know, i had cat on the show and he talked about like how the florida guys they will run four hours to go get places that are sneaky and if it's a three-day event like a toyota and there's a bunch of boats that makes a little bit more sense where you do want to find some fish alone but i i don't know like it's it's hard for me mentally if i had to justify if i had to turn out at least of i'm going to leave to go to the back of nanjamoin or port tobacco or further for a one day when there's a shit ton of fish here and I don't have to burn two hours of drive time. I think we probably I say, have to on this. Yeah, I would say my Jewish self would be like, why burn the gas? Um, and Blake would be like, let's haul ass. Uh, you know, Blake is all about running and gunning. And, you know, it, it, he is, he, no matter what, he is of the mindset of he's going to go to the place where he thinks he can catch the best quality fish in that tournament. And he's not going to let any other factor, you know, impact that whatsoever. Um, yeah. I have learned a little bit from that for sure. Um, but for me, you know, I, I, I definitely sometimes have that creep in my mind, like why burn a ton of gas and, you know, go all the way down and or all the way up and hurt my back for no reason. But, it just has to be so good to be worth a squeeze. And maybe yeah, it's I mean, more of a Dude, at there. like noon last year on the James, I was talking about, let's pull the plug and go to the chick. Like, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> and then I jumped off like a three pounder and we're like, shit, okay, we got to run this the rest of the day. And yeah. yeah, we did okay. But like, if I hadn't jumped off that three pounder, we'd have done fine. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm always of the mindset of like, I think in a one day, I, I think there's two ways to look at it, right? So in a one yeah. day, if you're on, the shit to win like you can win that tournament like you go there and practice you either see them shake them off whatever and you're like i can win this tournament down there go every time go yeah. but like let's say you're down you know that like you know you you might get down there and you're only getting 10 bites a day and you might only come back with four in a one day i'm fine with that like i'm if i think i can win that tournament Mm -hmm. in a two day or a three day or a four day i don't like that um i will do it but like it, it needs to be really good for me to do it in a couple day tournament because you have to put yourself in the right spot to even make the final day if there's a cut or to if there is no cut like the mpfl or whatever the regional if it's a two out of three days you need to be in striking distance before you make that move in my opinion um we're in a one day. You're always in striking distance because everybody starts at zero. That is, yeah, man, yeah, you're right. Though everyone is in striking distance. Because I do like, like to turn your gas. Like I, my foot is to the floor all the time. I I used to do that all the time in college, and I sucked at it in title, and I did good at like Lake Murray and Hartwell because it lends itself to that. But I just I was bad at. And I think it was, I was bad at running tides versus just figuring out an area on the grass. But I think it's other issues. Like I was better at grass than I was at the James fishing hard cover, getting that dialed in, like fine tuned. But like, I mean, we, we've talked about on the show before how like Nanjamoin is back. You know, I've, I've been talking about that forever. It's like, there's no way that place is just never going to catch a fish again. And it popped off. Is that where I, that dude was? Did he say that he was in Nanjamoin? Yeah. 
Yeah, he went all the way into the back of Ninja Moyo. So bad um, in this tournament. <laughs> and it was in, it was interesting because I've been talking about that forever. It's like there's no way that place would not never work again. And that's why no one's talking about it. And yeah, Dude, he if went you air there. this before Saturday, our buddy Jake is gonna go there a hundred percent. Oh my gosh. Um where's my thought? I could, oh, I remember my thought. So you have that end of the spectrum. I've had friends that tell me that there's 30 pounds in DC, but no one will go there because it's inconvenient. And I thought that was interesting because the harbor, the inner harbor, you have all those docks right where the seafood joint is. If there was a 30 pound bag, would it even be worth it because you have to buy the fishing license, the no wake and all the that? Fishing other license, $13. I'm not but worried about it's, that. It's to get it. It's the inconvenience of no, it. I'm not, it's, I, it's easier than Virginia. I bought yeah, it but, last year. But you're hardcore as shit. You don't care. You no, kill a small child super, to get up there. It's actually super easy. He like, I'm not being a small dramatic. child to get up there. <laughs> <laughs> if you told him there were 30 pounds waiting for him, he would do anything to get up there. <laughs> Look, I'm telling you, I spent a few days up there last year. It was the easiest out of state fishing license I've ever bought. It was way easier than buying New York. It was way easier than buying Maryland. It was way easier buying North Carolina. It was so easy. Like, if you can't figure it out online, you are actually incompetent with a computer. It's super easy. Do you think there's sneaky places up there that people are overlooking? This time of year? No. That has been just I don't think in general. Up there. Yeah. I, I think in the times of year when that river gets tough and like the winter, the fall, the, the early spring, when the grass isn't that good, I think that that hardcover can shine. But I don't. I just don't think that there's the upper echelon of fish up there. Cooper, there's what do no you think? Grass. Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak much on it because I don't have a ton of experience fishing up there. Um, I think there's there's certainly fish to be had up there, um, but I think you know you're if you're playing the odds right and, and yeah. if you're looking at it i mean there's a there's more high quality bags down river and that's just you know in my experience that's what i have seen um now can someone run up there and catch 25 pounds sure it could happen uh but what's the odds of them actually doing that and i would say it's pretty slim and um you know in a one day tournament where you don't get much practice you know, you got to really value that practice time and going up all the way to DC, it's going to take, it's going to take a whole day. Uh, we had a buddy who went up there and um, he went up there and spent the whole day fishing up there, didn't catch anything um, and wasted a day of practice. And so, you know, I mean, not gotta, wasted, but yeah. Yeah. And that boat ramp is a mess. Like, dude, that place is Reagan? terrible. Bradley Point. Yeah. Right, yeah, right there by the airport. Yeah. It's terrible. All those people just watching the planes go over, dude. It, it, it's a yeah, mess. It, it's a shit show there. It just that is interesting to me. I'm gonna definitely go up there and fish through that harbor again because I, I keep hearing stories of big residents fish there, and I think it's it's kind of sneaky. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I agree with you. There's not the the number anymore because the grass is completely dead, and you don't that's have many boats around you. You won't, but you got to be careful for people that don't know. You do not go barreling through Woodrow Wilson Bridge because I had a 50 cal point at me when I was in college because I barreled through there listening to some music and the Coast Guard, whoever they they do not like that. Yeah, You're not allowed to uh, be on pad go going through there for sure. Yeah, wouldn't recommend that. Anyway, getting back to the tournament then. So you get it dialed in. Were you guys having an issue coming to grips with what your game plan is you being yolo let's drive to the chesapeake and you're like no let's just go right out here past the boat ramp yeah it's funny so. because you know my stuff was all pretty close to the ramp that we fished and then his stuff was pretty far away uh so i mean it, it but no i mean we you know the night before we always sit down and kind of go through game plan and um you know it, it, it made it easy because in the morning that practice I shook off a ton of fish and, uh, you know, the one that I hooked in the area that I wanted to fish was a really good, good fish. Um, and he didn't really have much luck in that very early morning. And so it made it pretty easy for us to game plan and say, okay, let's start in the spot that I fished, shook off a bunch of fish, you know, catch our limit. And then Blake was able to find, you know, some, some, some higher quality fish that ended up really helping us at a window that made it very easy for us to map out our day. So, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I guess it, 
it wasn't that far um especially with no wind like we had like 20 minutes probably less than that okay that's not bad like so i fished from potomac creek up to matter woman that day of practice and i sucked ass like i did not like i had four bites the whole day how do you practice that much area and actually fish any of it out of curiosity that's a shit ton of water i mean i didn't fish like everything um oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. like i'll tell you i started in mallow's bay because that boat ramp is free um <laughs> and like i was like oh they're gonna be here dang right they're gonna be here there's no boats here there's not a stitch of grass there and i was like well this sucks and I didn't get a bite and wasted all of the good low water. So, like, I do think there was some fish to be caught, you know, in the creeks in the morning. And he was getting bit. So, I didn't feel like I had to move. But then, like, we kind of looked at it. And so, going back to how we've been saying, like, we focused on getting our limit. We kind of were talking on the phone throughout the day. And we're like, all right, well, we're going to be starting around where you had a good morning, right? So, at that point, I'm like, I got to find something else to supplement um we're not gonna ride all of his stuff like i gotta contribute a little bit and then a big storm rolled in and i'm like god man i gotta find somewhere to take cover so i see this marina and it was near a spot that i had caught a couple of good ones two weeks before that and i'm like all right let me slide over there and i'm gonna fish around and while it's raining if the lightning pops off i can run up on the bank and uh catch like a five five something which is big out there. I think it was like a five and a quarter. And I'm like, Oh, there's still good ones here. There's not a lot of bites to be had. And this was on like higher water, which was, we were struggling on higher water. And, uh, so that was like a really good sign for us. And we both said, if we get a good limit, you know, what would we say? 13 to 15 pounds out of, out of matter woman, then we'll turn around and, and make that run. Um, and, and go for what? that. Cause we know we, we knew 15 pounds is going to get you paid. That was my next question is like, what did you think was going to take? So you were thinking 12, 13, and then look for a kicker more than that. Um, I mean, we, we thought upper 15s would get you paid and I can't remember what actually did, but that's kind of what we thought. Yeah. Because it's been taken 20 recently, so it wouldn't be far paid? off. If, no, 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 to win. I'm sorry. To, to win is taking like 20 plus. So I didn't know if your mind was like, well, we actually need like 15 to 16 actually is where we need to shoot for or something like that. Yeah, I mean we we never saw anything over four pounds in Matter Woman in the in practice the day before. So we're Got like one that was right around four. Um, you in, did in practice, yeah. The but, day before. Yeah. Oh no, not the day before. I mean, I shook yeah. off a ton of fish. But, I mean, yeah. two weeks before when they were biting good, we both caught good ones in there. But we kind of figured it was more of a limit hole, like stay there till we get a good limit. Um, and if we have a good limit, we'll we'll go to that. I mean, literally that one spot and just see if they're there, if there's good ones there. Yeah. I mean, we felt pretty dang confident going in, you know, that we were going to catch 12 to 14 pounds off that first spot, you know, just yeah. based off of, you know, how it was fishing and, and what we were doing. And, and so, you know, the game plan was let's milk that, you know, fish it on low water, fish the active fish. And then like Blake said, I mean, then we put ourselves in the position to go and, and maybe waste some time if we need to and, and look for, you know, maybe some of those higher quality fish that, that Blake found in practice. And I think this was brought up before we recorded, but are the rocks at least of any, were they allowed or not allowed for this tournament? No, they're off limits. Okay. Good, good to keep in mind there. So yeah. So that's a major dumping ground that, that completely gets cut out. You wake up in the morning. What's your boat number? We had a good one this time. First time all year. Like, 16 or something like that 18 yeah it was the, like one of our only good boat numbers and um you know and it was the shortest run of, of the We're, you know shortest run of the season for sure just drop the trolling motor yeah, boat 18 <laughs> no we got on plane <laughs> we got on plane we didn't quite make it to the no wake zone but we got on plane yeah when did it start happening immediately and uh oh, shit. it's actually a funny it's a funny story because you know i was there and and i had caught a couple quality fish in that area in practice two weeks before and then you know the day before i go there and you know i set the hook on the first one and it's a three plus pounder and i'm like all right that's pretty dope i keep you know fishing around and i get bit maybe like 
my 20 or so fish and I'm just shaking off fish left or right. Like one time my power pulled down and I shook off maybe 10 fish all, you know, within casting distance. And I'm like, bet this is, this is awesome. This is amazing. Um, you know, no doubt that we're going to catch some fish here. And then in the tournament we go, we, we get to that spot and the first, like, I don't know, 10 fish are all like 10 to 12 inches. And, you know, after the fourth or fifth one, Blake looks over at me and is like, where the hell did you bring me? Like thinking, you know, like, man, I shouldn't have put my trust in this pool again. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, and then, you know, we ended up catching, you know, some quality fish. I think we caught like a little over 13 pounds in that spot, but we milked it. I mean, we stayed there, you know, two, three we hours, almost and three hours. Damn. We caught maybe like 40, 50 fish out of that one small area. And there was one, there's one point where, you know, we were joking is like a MLF spot, right? Because it was just cast after cast after cast and it was like wow. 14 inch or, um, but we ended up, you know, I think two of our keeper fish came out of there. One was just under three and one was right around four. I think um, it was just one, but yeah, I mean, we, we had a, a upper threes, like a four pounder coming out of there. Um, and then the rest were two or less. I mean, at one point we had a, a it was an upper three, something on my scale. And we had like a limit for like, 790 yeah <laughs> with a four pounder like we were just catching dinks and then it just slowly upgraded through there um once yeah. i saw that there was some quality there like we were we milked it out yeah, were you worried that were you worried that you were there too long no. we didn't have anywhere else to go honestly like <laughs> okay we had like two other spots nearby that we got some bites out of but i mean we're sitting there while we're fishing that spot you know where the no wake buoys are in there and there's probably 20 boats just around the no wake buoys because there was us there was two tournaments out of leesylvania there's a catch Jesus. out of uh hope springs there was i mean there's like six tournaments going on five or six and so there's just boats everywhere and you know mad a woman it's always like that so we looked like we peeked around the corner at a, at a flat that i had been on and caught some good ones a couple weeks before and there's like four boats on it and it's not very big and we're like all right well we'll just keep fishing here yeah when was it time to make the change or was it based on a weight that you guys had in your live well or based on the tide i mean both and and the bite kind of slowed down for us too and that's something that again we've we've made a big, big effort all years you know when when the fish stop biting you know we got to get moving and um you know the the tide got I think it was it was no longer outgoing it was incoming and you know starting it to to get a little bit more you know deeper water and um they just stopped biting on us and so we're like all right you know we this spot gave us what we needed to get we're not going to waste any more time here in this run yeah hmm. yeah we kind of ran a couple things and i don't even know if we caught a fish on the next three spots we went to that were nearby maybe one or two ones that didn't help and um we were like, we kind of looked at each other and we're like, let's make the run. It was also getting hot. So that was kind of nice. Get some air blowing. Um, yeah. And it, like I said, it was like 10 minutes, maybe. Like it was not that far, but it felt far because on the Potomac, everything seems close. Mm -hmm. um, but like, yeah, so we, we went over there and I'm like, all right, well, it's a big area. We're going to be here for probably what an hour and a half two hours just to fish it thoroughly and we're fishing for what we thought was going to be one bite and we ended up catching five out of there and i think we called out three or four of our fish there uh -huh. um and two of those was a four pounder and a five five and a half pounder like i think the four something came right on my waypoint from a four pounder the weekend before or two weeks before and then he caught the five and a half pounder I was probably yeah, I mean, noon, one o'clock, something like that. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty quick too. I mean, we got to that spot and yeah, I think it was like maybe five or 10 casts in. But one thing we did realize towards the end of that, you know, in that first spot, as the water started to become in, incoming and higher water, you know, they, they started not to be as active and, and um, they were very much just kind of like nibbling at it and um you know barely mouthing it and and things like that and so you know we went into it into that next spot and we're like okay 
we got to let them eat it. You know, we're fishing for one or two bites here. We got to really capitalize that and fish clean. And, you know, that first four or so pounder, I mean, I, I let him play around with it, eat it, swim with it for so long. Um, and then, you know, set the hook and we got him in the boat. And then, you know, I mean, maybe 10 minutes later, the same thing happened with the five pounder. Um, and, um, you know, I think that was key because I think very easily we could have missed those fish if we weren't concentrated on, you know, making sure that, that they had it and, um, you know, not setting this, the hook too soon. Yeah. And slowing down, like we made a big effort to like throw different baits in the morning. And, and as the day went on, like you throw a moving bait, I'll throw a, 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 a you know, throw a chatter bait and a speed worm. It's no secret. Right. So. Like How just hard kind of, is it to do that though? Like to, th I know so many old guys that will just throw a weightless Cinco and kick ass, but it's like, I would rather drill a hole in the side of my head than spend eight hours dragging a weightless sink. Uh, yeah. I mean it, I don't know, Potomac, it's easy cause you're getting bit. Um, yeah, that's true. It sucks on like Smith mountain after the spawn when you're like, I'm fishing for set seven or eight bites all day. And the only way I know how to get bit is to flick a Cinco under a dock. Yeah, that sucks. But I mean, the Potomac, like we started off the day, he was throwing a chatterbait. I'm throwing a uh, speed worm. And then like I caught that four pounder on a swim bait. And then he caught um, a bunch on a chatterbait. Dude, he jumps one off early in the day. That was like three pounds on a chatterbait. I'm like, and at that point we had like 12 and a half, 13 pounds. <laughs> like we are going to, mm. we needed that one. And we obviously didn't, but uh, you know, at the time it felt, very important um yeah. but then after that the moving bait just completely shut off on us and we had to really like he was throwing a speed worm and i was throwing a Cinco. like this terrible it sucks <laughs> do you think yeah. that how is it they still eat the damn chatterbait i've always been shocked about this because even the wop the whopper plopper was a fad the umbrella rig all these things i think that the freaking minnow will eventually like they will turn off to that but these idiots keep hitting the chatterbait <laughs> it's insane I have no idea. <laughs> they yeah. bite it. That's. I mean, they bite it, and and uh, yeah, I'll keep throwing it as long as I'm getting bit. I mean, if I go a long stretch on the Potomac and I don't get bit, then I know I need to put that bait down. Like on the, on, we couldn't really on the on the frog bite, we couldn't really figure it out that much. We got bit occasionally, but you know that it just wasn't happening. And so for me, I mean, my my two you know weapons in that tournament was the speed worm and and the chatter bait, and that I consistently got bit on those. Um, and I locked those in my hand and it, it wasn't too hard because we were, we caught fish all day. Uh, we caught a ton of fish and uh, I knew, I knew too, that, you know, the chatterbait will generate a little bit more high quality bites than like maybe like a small swim bait or, or something like that. So, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't too tough. I don't know why they bite it. It's, it's you know, nothing special. I see a billion of them. I wasn't throwing anything unique, you know, just black yeah. and blue jackhammer. So did you ever think about pressure too like pressure yeah we were there two weeks before and they were just choking a chatterbait like choking on it like i'm talking down in the crushers and then every fish we caught on the chatterbait was here the day before and in the tournament they almost quit biting it mm -hmm. so i almost think it's like when they haven't seen them in a while or you know they haven't been hooked in a while or i don't think you're hooking that many of them out of the grass like there's a, so many fish in that place and like yeah. i just I think it, you you have enough the dumb ones, and then once the dumb ones get tricked, it leaves the smart ones. Did I had a you know wh while we're recording this episode, guys, the the Todd Langford episode dropped, and he talked about the punching game that's on the Potomac on that heavy matted grass. Is that something that you guys ever dabbled with for this event, or even like what happened with that? Caught, we did it in the tournament. I mean, oh wow! I caught a I caught a handful of them in practice, and they were all quality, like two to four pounds. Um, in the tournament, I think we got one bite on it, and wow. we kept it honest throughout the day. We tried it everywhere we went. We would push up and punch the mat, um, just to try and keep bites honest. Um, and got one bite on it, and so by like one o'clock, we we're like, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. We need to ma maximize our time now. Yeah, that but is, we did know, you know, how important, you know, a bigger bite could be. And, you know, Blake had gotten some more quality bites punching. And so, 
again, keeping it honest was, I think, the right call to, to, to at least try it in those first few spots. And again, I think it was the right call to put it down because they clearly were just, it wasn't, it wasn't happening. Yeah, because that one is specifically, it's almost like glide bait fishing in the sense that when you commit to that, it's a time suck for the amount of bites that you generally get when you punch compared to a lot like chatter bait fishing or throwing a sinker. You're going to, sh you should catch a decent amount of fish for how long you do it. But punching, that's, that's usually not the game with that. And I've always curious people that implement that, it, at least it seems from like, you know, the bleachers where I'm at. People that are good at that, they just commit. It's either they punch or they don't. But it seems hard to implement as like, a, something in your arsenal on a tournament day like i'm gonna dabble with this and check this out but it seems like you guys did that fairly well yeah we didn't catch a fish on it so <laughs> but you didn't die doing it that's the big yeah. thing a lot yeah. of people will die doing that yeah. yeah and the one bite you got was like in the first like one first or second punch and we're like oh it's about to go down and then it gets sniffed again that's always mm -hmm. how it goes always how it goes you get bit as soon as you do something, and then you're just like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Yep. It's like when you try to get too sneaky and it works out initially, and you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm out, thought the room. And it's like, nope, I should have just done the check at Hammer and the freaking Senko because, of course, why not? Yep. When did you think you guys had something going on? I mean, when I caught that five and a half pounder, I was, uh, I was pretty happy. And, and there's a boat or two within yelling distance and, you know, I apologize to Blake after because I, I definitely yelled and pumped my fist. And, you know, because, you know, after catching a four and then that five and a half, I mean, we had a pretty dang good bag and we had north of 18 pounds. And we knew that that was that was a seal on a check at the very least. And I so say, I knew at that point we had a top five, right? Like 18 pounds can get you a top five out of a 70 boat field in Potomac every time. Yeah. Yeah. So in that moment, I mean, and it happened fast too. We went from 14 pounds to 18 pounds like that. And uh, after that one got in the boat and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the easiest thing to get in the boat either. Um, but we got it in and both of them, you know, even though I let them have it forever, the hook just popped out as soon as they got in the net or in the boat. Um, you know, as soon as it got in the boat, after a little bit of a fight, I was, I was pretty amped up and I knew we had, yeah. we had, a, we had a chance. Guys, we that's freaking awesome. We called awesome. a couple times after that too, like once or twice in the in that same spot, like quarter and half pound calls, and you know we knew we had upper eighteens. Cooper fat fingered the scale, which was making it hard to read. Um, you know he he put up a, a weight in bucket six, and we can only have five, so yeah. <laughs> um, we had to kind of be like, all right, so minus the bucket six, we got like eighteen. The scale based on math said like upper 18s and we're like well we probably have like 18 because we're probably doing the math wrong and uh yeah then we we left there when they quit fighting like we we were like all right do we run through this again we had the conversation do we run through this again if it's been good to us or do we feel like we've burned it down and we both agreed that we felt like we had burned it down and uh we made another this one was a longer run. That one was probably 25 minutes. Um, and that the big boats had gotten out by then, too. Yeah. And I didn't let up. Why make that run when you have such good weight? Why not just camp it out and work out there? We, we didn't think win. we had the Yeah, we didn't think we had the win. And I had in practice on that same exact tide caught a couple quality three plus pound fish. And so we had at that time a two and a half pounder and like a two and three quarters or so. And so we felt like our best mm. odds of running across a couple more three pounders to put that weight up to where we have a chance at winning was to run up where I had got bit the day before on that exact same tide. Um, and, you know, sure enough, I mean, it ended up not mattering. I mean, but it was the right decision because we went up there and we caught another three pounder and, uh, you know, we cold and, and did what we needed to do. Um, but, you know, that That's was so the, funny the too, like process. We pulled up next to like five or six other boats and we talked to one of our buddies and he's like, yeah, I've been in here all day. I've had like, I got like 12 pounds, haven't caught one over three. And then I immediately catch a three pounder. Like it's just understanding how they were biting, right? Like we had slowed down and we could see they were throwing a crankbait and a chatterbait. Like they were just going too fast. Yeah. Do you, do you think too many people, yeah, I'm going to word this. 
Do people slow down in general? Do you think that's the norm is to throw the Cinco and just to spend eight hours dragging it, or is the norm crankbait, chatterbait, eight hours? I mean, I think everyone loves to throw the moving bait if they're getting bit on it. And the Potomac, you get bit on it, right? So it's like, okay, why would I slow down if I am getting, you know, some bites here and there? And, um, you know, and it's painful to, to go and, you know, pretty much dead stick a Senko in the middle of a grass flat that, you know, is expansive and massive. It's like, you know, am I really going to do that? Um, so I would think, I mean, I would guess more people like to throw a moving bait, power fish, and, you know, not have to slow down. But. But then at the same time, you've got the guys that only fish slow. So, like, I I think there's probably more serious tournament fishermen that go too fast than too slow. I agree with that. Especially when you look at all the bent rods and stuff on the Potomac and you watch how they're fishing, it's like, yeah, like that. that's, that's the kind of the deal there. And, and there's an elegance to the simplicity of the big difference is just to do, it's not a weird ass Japanese bait or something like that or a crazy technique. It's just to eight hours, you just slowly drag a stick worm and you'll be rewarded because no one else has the fortitude to do that. And it's, it's, it's right there. We all know about the stick worm. I think it's again, like, I think I'll constantly say this That's where the Florida guys do have a little bit of an advantage. I've, I've, I've had a uh, Harry on this show who won Toyota two years ago. And I had him on when he fished the Toyota down at uh, the Harris chain. He said like, yeah, like I picked this area in the Harris chain and I power pulled down and I spent eight hours moving 200 feet because this is where they were at. It was pre-spawn. And they said, you just put down, pick up and drag. And it's hard to beat guys with that kind of freaking uh, fortitude to do that. And I think if more of us did that in certain situations, we would be rewarded because no one else does that. It's so obvious, but so many anglers aren't willing to just do that in certain areas of the lake or the river. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, we talk about all the time, like, can you win it? Like, do you think your AOY finish would be higher or higher if you fished nothing but a Cinco the whole year? And yeah. all of us every year have said, yeah, I definitely do think it would be. Now, mate, yeah. fifth, yeah. I don't know, but like, when we were finishing 10th and 20th, we're like, yeah, absolutely. Like, I didn't have a limit in the tournament. You know, like, that's when we're like, yeah, we probably should have done that. Yeah, I think if you had a, a stick worm, a drop shot, one moving mate, and a jigging minnow, like those four rods, you probably would be okay, like, everywhere. I mean, for God's sakes, John Cox just throws a goddamn wacky worm in a swim jig everywhere, and he, he does well. Like, it... it it's not rocket surgery. It really is not. Yeah, I mean, one of the you're telling you know, guys don't fish the elite seventy. Rob, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for Osnick, you know, he he throws that wacky worm and he kicks everyone's ass. I mean, it it just it it plays, no doubt. Yeah, especially the time of year that you should be going to these places. You know, like you don't need all these weird ass techniques, especially if it's pre spawn all over the country. Like docks and a wacky worm, they freaking play. Like it just it does. Yeah. What, what, I have 11 what, rods out to go fish on the James right now. I don't know if that's to healthy or not, practice. though. It's, there's not many Blake has so play. many rods, it's pretty much impossible for me to fit any in the rod locker, you know, during the tournament. Just, that's not true. I took, like, when we go to the rivers, I take all my lake rods. I Look, I didn't have my jerkbait rods. I didn't have my Carolina rig rods. I mean... I slimmed it down for you when we go to the rivers. <laughs> but the lakes, yeah, that. that's, that's a problem. That's hard because I got friends that'll catch them on a jerk bait on the Potomac right now. Like, but you can't fish everything at the same time. That's where it's so hard. Where I had friends like, oh, the spinnerbait bite for smallmouth is back. You need to add that to the rotation. Like, I can't think about that right now for this tournament. Like, there's, I can't throw a swim bait, a swim jig, a chatterbait at the same. I got, I have two hands. That's it. And it, that's where I like, I get my analysis paralysis. Like I can't throw everything. So what the hell is the point of having half this shit in my boat? So for, yeah, me, I, I, for me, I like to have it out because like, I know, yeah, I'm probably going to use three, four rods most of the day, but I'm going to stop and I'm going to like, if I see a, a two cast deal, right, right over there where I think shit, there might be a shaky head spot. And I haven't gotten a bite on a shaky head in two weeks. I want to have that shaky head out because I'm lazy. And if it's in the box, I'm not digging yeah. it out for three casts. I'm going to flip yeah. that Texas rig over there and I'm going to miss the target or it's not going to be the best presentation presentation ever. So like right now, like, like I said, I have 11 rods out for the James probably going to touch 
five or six of them for the most of the day, but I might have three casts with another. The Brian right? Thrift mentality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got you. So that makes sense. That's kind of it, all my friends give me shit because I've got so many rods out, but like it, it's because I might go somewhere where I got to make five casts with a Carolina rig and I'm going to have it out because if I don't, I'm not digging in the box to get it. Yeah, and no, I will say there's some value there. I mean, last year we finished third on the Potomac in the Elite 70, and one of our critical fish ended up being on a bait that Blake picked up for a one or two cast deal. I mean, we're going down the bank, and he sees a, an area. He's like, this this looks fishy. I'm going to throw this bait. And, you know, he ends up catching the three-plus pounder. That ended up helping us a lot. So, I mean, there's definitely value there. Um, as a Is co-angler, I can't have boat it. into the backside of the tree on? No, no. That yeah. was when you, that was when you, I think it was, it was like that little, like, um, like kind of like flat, like do nothing bank. And I'm like, that looks so ugly. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It was but, a little sandbar that came out and I hadn't thrown a chatterbait all day and I picked that sucker up and just banged it into the back of the Saturday and it locked up with like a three and a half pounder. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that it was Keats. I mean, as me, as a, as a co-angler, I can't bring you know, 14 rods and throw it all in the boat. So, but, and I guess this is where it's like interesting for me is I'm fishing a, a boat series and a kayak series this year and I catch bigger fish in the kayak thing. And there's so many variables we could go into that about like where I can get to, it's a smaller boat, all that crap, but I just take less crap. I don't have 38 rods. I have to trim it down. And yeah. that's something I'm trying to implement more in my boating thing. The one thing that's helped me in boating wise is since I fish kayak is I don't try to fish the whole damn lake like kayaking forced me to pick the best spot and milk it. And I'm trying to do that in the boat of pick the best spot and figure it out versus saying like, I got a 250. Well, I better use this bitch because I got it. Yeah. And that mentally has helped me so freaking much. Um, Nolan Miner, again, one of the first interviews I did, he said like when I got into kayak fishing with, with live scope, I realized how many fish I would leave if I had a boat. And that blew my mind so much about how I approached some of these bodies of water. And, but then, yeah, it's so, but I can feel both you guys' arguments because I get it. Like, you go down There's the lake. There's also, yeah. you know, a difference between a team tournament and a solo tournament, right? I mean, we True. can throw complementary baits and we True. can kind of balance each other out. But if you're fishing by yourself and you're fishing an area and you're only throwing one bait, you know, that it, it does make your mind spin of like, oh, did I, was I just throwing the wrong presentation? You know, would a bottom bait have picked up a couple bites versus like me, if I'm on the back of the boat, I'm trying to complement whatever he's throwing on the front of the boat. So if he's throwing moving bait, I'm throwing a bottom bait or vice versa. Right. And so we can keep everything or as much as possible honest. Um, and that, you know, team tournaments, there's that, that value versus that solo tournaments you just don't have. I think that's why it works so well, the wacky worm, because that is such a, if you're a fish, the wacky worm kind of appeals to any type of fish in any type of mood. Top water bait, you got to be in a specific type of move. A, a big swim bait, you're a wacky worm. You might not want to eat, but you'll eat a damn wacky worm. And I think that's why that kind of takes off for so many pro tournaments. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, going back to like too many rods out, I think it's all confidence. Whatever gives you confidence throughout your day is what you need to do. We are all head cases. A buddy of ours, Jake, he, he's had a lot of success. And I watched him go into a tournament at Bugs Island. A solo tournament. Hit five rods on the front deck. Two shaky heads, two swim jigs, and one with no bait on it to tie up whatever he needed it throughout the day. Because he's like, I only know how to get bit on a shaky head and a swim jig. That's what I'm going to do. And yeah. me, I, I never do that. But it's, and he went in and he got a check. You seem right? like you're offended by that. Like, I would <laughs> never have two rods. <laughs> I mean, I just, I've tried it and it doesn't work for me. I end up digging more out and... <laughs> Like it, it just doesn't work for me. So it, yeah. it's confidence. I agree with that. Confidence is key. I mean, this sport is so mental. Um, you got to do what works for you. Could you actually fish a tournament as a challenge where you just had one rod in the boat? <laughs> I, I mean, could. I, do it. I would do it, but I wouldn't like it. <laughs> 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 I've always wanted to do that for a challenge for myself personally. It's like, I'm going to just take one rod and just add a couple of baits and that's it. Yeah, you can retie, but just oh, to kind of like that. limit your shit. And, I and could do that, see. but I'm going to have like five baits hung in the carpet next to my feet. So I don't have to go in the compartment. So you really believe it's the bait then? 
more than anything else. You have to change the bait. Depends where you are. Or would you make the bait choices you have very generic so they appease to most fish? I mean, like, I'd have a seven foot medium heavy out, right? And so I'd have, I'd probably have like a shaky head of some, or Texas rig of some sort tied onto it. Probably a Texas head, Texas rig, 316, so I can throw crawls, I can throw worms, whatever. And then I'm going to have a square bill hung in the carpet. I'm going to have a DT8 or a DT10 hung in the carpet. I'm going to have a spinner bait. I'm going to have a chatter bait. And I'm just going to cut it off and retie it. I'm going to have my scissors laying in the next to the troll motor pedal. Because at that point, like, it's the same thing. I don't have to go in the compartment to get it. I would probably fish an archaic style like jig that I could swim and flip. And that way, the same bait. It'd have to be, I'd have to pluck the skirt to make it a little bit more finessey looking. But then I can I can hit specific targets, drag the bottom, or just swim the damn thing, and I could do both with the same bait. Never have to change that, or probably a stupid stick worm if I'm fishing, depending on where I'm fishing. Honestly, yeah, you know. I'd probably just have a drop shot. I mean, tied up, and you know, drop <laughs> that, shots get big, and they cheating. they catch fish, and you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, I'll, I'll catch five. I can promise you that. No, yeah, you, you probably you probably win the tournament too. Sadly, like that's no. how it works for the stupid drop shot. Got, we were fishing got, the James. You'll break um, them all off. I know. We, I was just going to say that we were fishing the James uh, last week. We thought there was a Tuesday night. Well, Blake told me there was a Tuesday nighter and ended up not being a Tuesday nighter. And I was like, all right, well, we're going to go out all there. Year. And the one <laughs> time gonna, they skipped a week. I was like, well, okay, well, we're already here. We're going to go out there. We're going to, you know, kick 20 pounds. And, you know, one of the first spots we go to hook into six pounder on drop shot. You know, Jesus. It's jumps and then dives and, and breaks me off and Blake just looks at me like I'm the biggest idiot ever by the uh, drop shot. But it is what it is. Put it on 20 pound test, you'll be all right. They get bit. Yeah, you, on 20 pound test, they get bit too. You had it on 10. I had it on 12, but yeah. What's the heaviest you go up with your drop shot? Do you ever power 20, shot? 22. I had it on 22 on Saturday. Braid or fluorocarbon? Are we talking about the Fluoro. leader or are we talking about the main line? Straight 22 pound fluoro. God damn, dude. Wow. Yeah, he loves to throw that little bubble shot. It's he not even a bubble shot. It's got 316 sound weight. It's a drop shot. And I'm flipping it like I would on a spinner rod, but I got a heavy action rod and 22 pound test, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hurt him. <laughs> oh my dude, god. Dude, I Paul. sent one, I hit one with that on Saturday, <laughs> and it it was like this long. I mean, it was small. It flung up over the boat came out and got hung in a tree over my head. That's domestic abuse right there. Dude, That's what that bad. is. We were dying laughing. Yeah, I was going to say, I relief. bet you Blake was laughing really hard after that one. <laughs> it was the only comedic relief we had because Daniel had lost every fish that had bit. You know what's weird? And I found this out the hard way. First time ever in a tournament, it feels like I lose more fish on bait casters than spinning rods, especially if I have everything dialed in with the drag. I don't lose fish like I do on bait casters where I feel like I just pull too hard. I really, you I you fish in a, like a lake where there's open water around or are you fishing heavy cover? I mean, I think it's totally different on Smith mountain on a point. Give me a spinner rod all day. I'll work those suckers down. True. True. Yeah. I'm not talking like thick. I'm not talking super duper thick, uh, mats. Like of course then you have to, but even docks and stuff, I feel like I just, Pull to because I still have I've skipped a, a a Cinco back underneath the dock with light stuff and I can course them out. But if I try to hit them hard and they jump, I feel like that's when they throw stuff and they throw stuff more on a bait caster when you're trying to pull their ass up into or out of whatever it is. And I don't know how to I don't know the answer. To that it's more of an observation with me personally. I pull harder on bait caster, therefore they jump more. That's kind of what I've seen. You want me to convince you otherwise? The guy that threw one into a tree? Yes. So let's, let's hear this. <laughs> so last year, the two-day at the Potomac, I couldn't get a bite in the grass, and I roll up some docks. And first dock I go to, I had like a 10-pound leader on. Skip under there with a Senko. Like a three-pounder pops off. Barnacles. All right, um, I'll go to 12. Go to 12. I broke off six fish that day on everything up to 14-pound test on barnacles under docks mm. because on a spinning rod, you can't pull them out from under there. You have to try to play them. Even on a medium heavy spinning rod, you still like, there's just not the same leverage that there is 
with 18 pound and a bait caster when you can hit them in eight, eight to one gear ratio and you just ski them back. It's the fall in Potomac. We're not talking about six pounders. Like, so I think it's all situational. Like, Smith Mountain, I completely agree with you. Like, you can play them. Those docks don't have barnacles. Really, you're watching out for metal is what you're watching out for, which we got got by that in college on some metal. Mm-hmm. It's Smith Mountain, actually. You remember that, Cooper? Yep. Yeah, drop shot. That's shaky. Shake fish. Yeah. Oh, is it shaky? I thought it was drop shot. But... No, no that's, that bait sucks. Don't throw it. <laughs> what, 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 is your, what is your heavy duty then setup then? You're talking about it. What is your rod and reel for that? I mean, it just depends. Like, we've got a lot of the four power Dobbins on the front deck, which is, I think they call it a heavy, but it's like a medium heavy plus. Um, yeah. I've got some five power Dobbins, which are like what I would call as a heavy. They're, they're stiff. Um, like, my frog rod's extra heavy. I don't, I don't know. Like, I think it just depends. Like, that, that power shot, that 22 pound test is typically on a four power just because it'll bow up better. Um. Yeah, four uh, a four or five power Dobbins typically. Yeah, I mean for me, I I rarely go above a four power Dobbins. I mean the the four powers I I just absolutely love. Um, and I feel like they have enough power and and they're really light and I get a ton of sensitivity for them. Um, and I haven't really had a problem with breaking off fish or or anything like that. And you know, one thing that we've done really well this season is fish really clean. Um, and I do think if, if I hook that four or five pounder, you know, in the tournament on the spinning rod, I don't think I get those fish in the boat, uh, just based off of the conditions of what they did to, to me with the spinning, oh, with the, the bait casters. So, um, you know, there's no perfect gotta, science, but I got to get to do that more with bait casters. I'm so hung up on the setup I have now, which so far has worked and when it stops working i'll probably make the switch to bait casters because i'm using i'm using an inshore redfish spinning rod with a inshore like i'm using 80 pound braid to a 22 pound fluorocarbon leader because i can skip that bitch for a mile because i hate birds nesting and i'm not buying a 400 dollars dial or reel with magnetic brake it's just not it's too expensive for that it just is i'm sorry like oh I man i can't imagine blake would give you so much shit if you were in our group and and you came up with an inshore rod with he won. He hates braid to fluoro leaders. I would say I hate him. him now too. Yeah, he <laughs> he would be in some trouble. <laughs> it works for snook. It works for tarpon. Having a little leader. And if you can skip a pilchard under a dock and catch a redfish in a snook, why can't you catch a bass? I mean, oh, I'm not it's... saying you can't. I'm just saying it's soft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Learn sure. how to skip a bait cast. Like it's not that hard. Uh, yeah, or I, I can outskip you though with with my no, setup. Can't. No, you can't. I will physics. say, I mean, Blake's casting like, and we, I give Blake a lot of shit. Uh, but that one thing I won't give him shit over is, I mean, he just he's on the front of the boat, and and the way he could put his bait where he wants it, especially that frog deal. Um, I mean, it's it's impressive. True, but let's we're talking a, about let's put a half ounce physics. jig on and let's put a half ounce jig on and see who's putting it where they want. Are we talking about casting distance or accuracy? No, no, we're going to go down a dock line and I'm going to put damn targets on posts up under it. And we're going to see who can hit the most targets. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll have me on accuracy. I thought we we're talking about casting distance because there's no way in hell you're going to outcast me. Like, that's, that's, that's not happening. Like, I'm okay. oof, we'll like a $10. I got a, bait, I got a bait caster set up for throwing a fluke that I've never had a spinner rod outcast. Okay, I, I I have an inshore setup like physics, like it's a bail. The bail is gone and the line shoots out. That's why surf fishermen use that and not some Daiwa bait caster, man. Like that's how that works. But yeah, let's do this. We'll do a uh, a ten dollar live bet. stream. Yeah, please yeah. do that. I I would love to see that. I would love. Yeah, we got to make this happen because I'll do it, dude. I'm telling <laughs> dude, I, you. Were you Cooper? Were you at Cherokee that year that he was that? Uh, yeah, he was saying he could outcast me. Oh yeah. I think I won yeah, like twenty shaky bucks head. Yeah, that was a, yeah, it's shaky head or fluke or something. And I was like, "Come on, mm-hmm. we gotta try this." Yeah, because I want to put this. I want to put this to rest. I already pissed one friend off with this setup. So, and now How about like a mag draft. You can you put a mag draft on a dime with that spinning rod? I can skip that shit a mile and a half, and it will never blow up. And that's yeah, yeah. But like, can you? No, I can't stop it. A, yeah, no, I can't we're going stop down it. A dock line, like you're gonna lose so many mag drafts. We already lose a billion of them skipping docks as a with a bait caster. You're gonna lose 
millions. But I've never birds nested ever. It's fine. I've and only I'm tangled, in... like a few reels this year. Exactly. But that's my point, though. I never have that stress in a tournament of nuking a reel in a tournament. I got a, I got more in the box. Okay, I don't. I'm married. Like I can't. I can't deal with. <laughs> I'm engaged and I'm but poor. I... <laughs> but I'm poor because I got reels. <laughs> That's your financial advisor. <laughs> Cooper's got as many rods and reels as I do. Don't let him talk that smack. Nah, you you definitely got me beat. But um, I mean, we all got a ton of money. I mean, it, the reels do make a huge difference. I mean, oh, if do. you're if you're buying a fifty to hundred dollar bait caster, you're trying to skip that and you know put it places where you need to put it under docks. I mean, you're gonna have a hard time keeping up with you know. Some of the higher quality stuff it just I it's just line, yeah. line makes so much of a difference agreed like being dialed with your line like agreed. i'm super particular with what brand model like i don't think it's the bet like some line i do think is better than others right but i'm used to it so it's what i'm putting on there because i want to know when i roll that cast what it's going to do right where mm -hmm. like there's certain braids that i don't like the cooper used to throw cheap braid on a frog and his distance just wasn't there, right? Like he just couldn't go. He could throw it around shallow stuff all day, but when he went to go hum one on a grass flat, it just wouldn't go. Yeah. So there is better line, but I, I think it's more about just being consistent with what you're using. Yeah. Better line, better gear, and, and just adjusting things, tinker, 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 and find out what works best for you. Um, yeah, no, dude, guys, I 100% agree with that. Uh, I mean, Blake. I don't even want to know how much money I've stripped off of a reel in line. Oh, I know I've done that a lot, a lot, especially because I buy the big spools of braid, the the expensive, like six hundred to a thousand yard spools, just so I can get everything kind of laced up um, and be done with. But anyway, that's a whole. But like, we don't have to talk about. Yeah, we don't have to talk about my tackle warehouse orders. Like that's not healthy. But uh, anyway, what do you guys got coming up, and what can we plug and promote for you guys? Thank you. Cooper. I don't have much to be honest. Um, I What's actually, going on with Fidelity? I'm I'm dealing with <laughs> <laughs> I'm dealing with a pretty major back issue um, that's going to really limit my ability to fish, and so I'm uh -huh. I'm honestly going to take a few months here. You know, I, we have a couple tournaments here in the fall. I'm going to really try to spend the next couple months rehabbing it and trying to get it back to to where it was before. But um, so I don't really have much. I mean. We got asked to be a part of the Battle of the Border tournament in October. That'll be cool. Um, we qualified since we ended, you know, top five. It looks like we might qualify for um, the the is it Bass Nation Championship down in Louisiana in December. Um, so that'll be cool. Uh, and we got Elite Seventy tournament in fall too. So for me, in the next couple months, uh, I'm just going to try to take it easy. And I actually just sold my boat a couple days ago, and I've gotten endless shit from Blake for it, but, uh, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. So is that to pay for your back surgery is like, what is, why'd you sell your boat? Dude, he's a financial advisor. Boats are like the worst thing you can do. Dude, if, if his customers found out he was a boat owner, he'd lose all of his clients. Yeah. I mean, financially it was lost out another thousand for me. It's like, you know, how much am I, I don't want to have all this money in a depreciating asset that I can't really use right now. And there's always going to be a time for me to buy another boat. And so, you know, just keep it, you know, in pocket, in my back pocket. And, you know, if my back and my health gets better, I'll, I'll be able to, to, to buy another one. So to be fair, pocket. though, I could argue yeah. that marriage is a depreciating asset. So it really is. It just depends. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> um, no, I mean, he sold his boat. You know, he is who he is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, Coop, how how did you hurt your back? Was it from carrying Blake all year or like what happened? Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Like I mean, you should, you should be grateful. Um, no, I mean, it's just, I got, I played sports all growing up, baseball, basketball, football, and I didn't realize it, but I got degenerative disc disease. So my spine, you know, degenerates and, you know, falls apart a lot faster than the other people. So I got a herniated disc, pinched nerve, degenerative disc disease. Um, so you know, it's potentially a major fusing surgery that I might have to to go for. Um, but right now I'm just trying to, to avoid that at all costs. So, yeah. Jesus. Blake, is your boat wheelchair accessible? No. 
we don't what's funny phones. too is like for me like with blake and i we fish so differently and i think that has some value in, in a team tournament but like for me i have to always be mentally sharp and so like every tournament i have to at least spend 10 minutes to sit down and eat a sandwich and rest my back and for that whole 10 minutes i can just feel blake just getting angrier and angrier and angrier and he'll sometimes look back at me and you know give me the eye and i'm like dude i'm just i'm just trying to eat you know it's not the eye because you're eating it's because you're eating cocktail shrimp in the middle of a what tournament the hell? <laughs> Dude, oh, this guy blew it up with a bag. Yeah, you have a bag nice is very long it's right a now. Ziploc bag of cocktail shrimp. Dude, high protein, quick, easy. I mean, it, it made sense to me. He's supposed to eat it cold. Um, you know, it worked out well. But you know, now I, I get a ton of shit because I'm the cocktail shrimp guy. I only had it for once or twice. Um, I did leave it in Blake's boat once, and I, I guess it got a little smelly, which wasn't good. <laughs> oh my god, that's freaking awesome. It's disgusting. Blake, what do you got coming up? It's two BFLs on the James. Hopefully we can get some good action there. And then uh, probably going to fish a couple local things on the James just throughout the summer. I like to hop in a couple cats so we can fish the cat championship. Uh, that's a fun tournament in May. Daniel and I fished that this year and did well. And, um, you know, it, uh, probably fish those. And then, God, what do we have in september there's a, i think there's a two day on bugs then we've got elite 70 championship in uh october battle of the border and then trek on down to louisiana hopefully yeah i mean really just fishing like i, I work so i can fish and sometimes i don't work enough but yeah hey, i think you're making the right financial decisions don't listen to him that's right uh, thank do, you do you guys fish chestnut at all no <laughs> they, they got them there though so is that just a, a, a spiritual decision that you have that you won't fish there? Or like, well, what's the deal? We used to call that place Lake No Pattern when I was growing up. Um, you could go out there and smoke on them. And then the next day they'd be completely gone. I also, like when I got out of college, I was fishing the Elite 70, starting to get into BFLs and they just don't go there. So like my time just wasn't well spent there. If I'm going to fish a local tournament, I can fish one on the James almost every time there's one on the on Chesden. And the James one will have more money in it. And I'm spending a lot more time out there. Um, they've got them on Cheston, though. Like, they catch them out there. Uh, and, honestly, they should be able to have that tournament, the Elite 70s at Cheston, right? Like, it's big fish. enough. Have you been there? It's, they have fish really small. Dude, it would be like Anna fish is small, and that place would fish. I mean, it, it would be, it'd be like those Ohio BFLs. Like, well, I fish those. Just, yeah, like, it's not, oh, they're fun. It's not, fun like you that's the other thing about the elite 70s we go to good places at good times that's and true so like it's fun too even if you don't get a check we everybody like potomac dude everybody smoked it. um i, I it just is, don't think it would be fun it is weird about that like it it's supposed to be fun i mean how am i gonna rephrase this Kerr sucks. I think Kerr. I think Kerr gets too much hype because it's big, and therefore it gets praise when it shouldn't because it's a shit like this should be drained and then just re restocked and everything. But then I let's got a better one. Let's let's turn High Rock into a skate park. I, I agreed. High Rock is a great example. Aquaquan it's Reservoir. It's small and it's shitty. But you can be small and good though. Aquaquan Reservoir. It yeah. takes thirty pounds to win, or you don't. I'm a Okay, yes, so an average of five fish, yeah. like five pounders, like, oh, boo-hoo. Oh, yeah, they got them in there. Yeah, but it's 2,000 acres. If, if Chesden pumped out those kind of weights, would it be worth to have a tournament there? Like, it, it, I guess my point is, like, if the lake is small, but it's got weight, is it worth it then? Because on the flip uh -huh. side, Kerr is big, but it takes four pounds to win. Like The other eh. conversation to have about Chesden is you have three ramps on that lake. You got Whippernock seven springs in the public one at Dinwiddie. The public one at Dinwiddie, you're going to have to get a permit to run a tournament out of. And it's, you could probably get 70 boats in there, but there'd be no, no other room. Like it would be full. This is not just a seven springs, conversation. You're not man. doing it. Seven yeah. springs. You're not doing it. The ramp is hot garbage and it's $15 put in there. Like it's Potomac and your trailer gets broken pulling out. Whip or not. I maybe you could get 70 boats in there. Maybe. It's just not. Yeah. 
and, and I guess any, there's no logistical sense in it. I'm thinking bigger picture of not just Chesden, but because I've had this argument about Lake Anna for BFLs and stuff, where if a if a lake is small but it puts out good weights, people don't want to fish it. But if a lake is big and it has shit weights, people want to fish it. And that to me is like that's interesting that conversation yeah. there because if a lake is good. If it fishes small, that's fine if I have a chance to do it. I hate Kirk because it's just not fun. In general, I just don't – it's – eh. I can catch that kind of weight up here on the Ohio River where I fish on the Upper Potomac. I, I, it, a high rock, the same thing. There's not a lot of fish. It's not fun. So, yeah. But at Lake Anna, at least, they do have big ones in there, and you can smoke them, especially the times you they go for tournaments. I think that's interesting – an interesting conversation because it's the same thing with Gaston, right? Like Ga Roanoke Rapids is another good one. Like I know Roanoke Rapids got some donks in it, even I mean, though it's small. Be, yeah, but that place is Occoquan size. Yeah, I mean, like I said, like it's small, but like the weights would be freaking insane on the top half of the of the uh, first place, second place, and third. I don't, I don't know. know. I think I think I put a lot of thought into the Anna one, right? Because they smoke them out there, and there's big ones in there. As much as I hate that place, like it's got yeah. big ones. It's got big and, ones, and um. There's just BFLs require for 150 boat. You can run a 150 boat tournament out of Lake Anna. You can't run a 150 boat BFL because you've got all the co anglers driving there themselves. Yeah, that's true. That's a true. A lot of team partners ride together or meet halfway. Like the facility, like we, that. I fished a 150 boat tournament at Lake Anna out of Anna Point, and it, 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 half the people are going to put in over at High Point. A couple yeah. will put in down at Sturgeon, but. You know, if you start doing a BFL, like it's going to be a mess. Yeah, it's interesting because, like, the Veterans Day tournament last year, they had like 121, 140 boats, it, but the whole place shuts down to accommodate it. So I agree. Logistically, that would be an issue. Um, and that's with the co anglers riding with the boaters yeah. for probably 100 of those boats. Lake size wise, I think that's easy. I think mm -hmm. Gaston, I think the lake is perfectly big i think that's a perfect thing for the bpt bpt should bounce between kerr roanoke rapids and gaston they could do all three lakes in their dude, tournament the final day on roanoke rapids that'd yeah be cool. that'd be bitching dude that that i want to see i just want to see people catch big ass weight out of that place it's so freaking cool um gas and i the wish they would lake right that's what they call yeah. it yeah like you will lose a lower unit allegedly in there because there's so many stumps and grass and crap in there still um allegedly uh Not the uh I want to. I want to go there. They're in Back Bay. I've heard people are just smoking them in Back Bay, apparently. But there's like no mapping Dude, of it. Just go to the Chawan. Just go the to Chawan. any of those rivers on the Albemarle, and they are so good. It's yeah, I mean, unbelievable. Oh, we were so excited when we heard that we were going to the Chawan this year, and yeah, it didn't disappoint. We didn't catch the fish we wanted to catch, but but it's I mean, fun. It was, you know, it was like, amazing. Yeah, yeah. There's two nines and like a couple eights weighed in in the tournament. Jesus Christ. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. It, it was – that place is goofy. I've been there uh, – I've been to almost all the rivers on the Albemarle, and every single one, either I or my co-angler, has hooked or caught a, a fish over six pounds. Every single one. Do you know where I would love Steve to do – he would never do this – is the Rappahannock River. Go old school because that that place has got some donks in it. It's it, it's it? Size-wise, it's good, but I don't know about ramp-wise. I don't know. I didn't even know that it had good fish in it. I thought it was, or maybe I'm thinking of the Pamunkey. Pamunkey's got a bunch of little ones in it. Pamunkey's got a bunch of good smallmouth fishing, right? What? The Rappahannock? Yeah, I thought so. Maybe the upper one. Yeah, the the upper above the break. Right now, the world record snakehead's going to come out of there for sure. Um, but then there's also, there was great largemouth fishing back in the day. It went down, and that started the stocking program of the F1. They hit that thing first, and then they gave, saved up money, and then they started dumping stuff into the chick. So, but hmm. apparently, somebody along the line, the rumor is the boat ramp. People complained about the boat ramp. People stopped fishing tournaments out of there, and it just it really in Virginia. If you don't fish tournaments, it disappears out of the zeitgeist. So that to me is what's interesting about the Rappahannock. I'm going to go down there and actually spend a week just fishing it because I just don't think it gets pressured at all. And apparently the frog fishing is supposed to be banging down there because they just don't see frogs. Oh, allegedly. So fun. Dude, yeah. That's there was a 14 pound snakehead weighed in in our side pot at the late 70s. Dude, that thing had that thing's out of locker was reel. So big. Dude was it's, holding it up like this and it was freaking, touching the ground. Oh my God. They also have so 
our buddy was leading the big snakehead side pot with like 11 and a half. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm probably going to win the big snakehead. These dudes came in with like a 12 and a 14 pound snakehead. They had two of them that big. We were like, what the hell? Have you, what's the biggest snake? Have you hooked a 10 pounder before? He caught one last year. I haven't. That one yeah, you caught when the chick was big. Those Not things will. That was on a Texas rig speed crawl too. It was it was crazy. But those things yeah. will lock you up, man. I mean, they they freaking smoke you. <laughs> Dude, I had one practicing this year. It flushed a buzz bait like a four pounder would, and I was like, "Oh yeah!" And then it was like a two pound snakehead, and I was pissed. Ruined a, a brand new buzz bait too. Just oh ruined. yeah. I've had so many lipless uh, crankbaits just destroyed because of those stupid things. But those big ones, man, oh my God, when you hit them, especially in like pads, I did that on the Antietam thing. I was flipping pads and I hit this thing and my God, the whole pad field like exploded. <laughs> Let's do our dock skipping contest and then go bow fishing for snakehead at night. That's a date. Yeah. I've always wanted to do that. That's something I've always wanted to do is, is bow I'm fish. In. Do you know how many beers I could drink in that day? I could throw down some shots of tequila. Because you're buying so, them all after I beat you, but... Uh, like the bow I'm fishing good. or the skipping? The skipping. The bow fishing, you're probably going to beat my ass. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I'll get you that, that thing of Coors. We'll keep it Mexican. I'm sorry, not Coors. I freaking Corona. What the hell? Jesus <laughs> Christ. I'm, I'm sorry to my Coors sponsor. Uh, Blake, uh, any, that. anything that we can promote for you? Anything we got going on before we get this thing going? No, we're riding solo, man. Just uh, going fishing. Follow us on Instagram, Blake Miles Bassin, and uh, yeah, it's a good time. As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Please give these guys a follow. Check them out and stuff. Uh, if you guys have any questions for me, please email me, Fishing the DMV. Please like us on uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It really helps out in the algorithm. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.